This is Jim Janesey. In this lecture, we're going to talk about evolving computer architectures. This is contained in Contemporary Computing, the workbook. It's in Unit 2 on pages 53 through 59. This lecture covers the evolution of computers from the 1950s on to the present time. And I'm going to use some illustrations, such as the one you see here, to tell you about how those computers worked and what they were designed to do and how many computers and microcomputers came along to first supplement and then to supplant mainframes. What you're looking at here is a diagram of how mainframe computers were originally thought best to operate in a batch mode. What's going on here is a world that depends on devices such as card punches, which you see in the upper left corner, producing roughly dollar bill sized cards that would have punchings on them. Each column of punchings on the 80 column card would represent a different character or number. On the right, you see a tape drive. The larger reel that you see pictured is about 10 inches in diameter and holds about 2,000 feet of tape. It's mounted as one of the reels on a drive, as you see in the lower right corner. And that drive might be about the size of a refrigerator. So these were not small pieces of equipment. The way that an equipment configuration was set up in batch programming days, typical update cycle for a master file, which might be a file of customers, and the master file might have information about their name or address or various other information about the customer. Updates to this file were made by coding transactions on a key punch. So part of the design of these systems was programs that would read a certain format a punch card and at the same time would read a tape file, a tape master file, that stored information in a more compact way than cards. With this processing scheme, these transactions and the master file would have to interact at the direction of a program. And that interaction, which you see here with sort of an intertwining of these files, is done by a program that reads both the transactions and the current master file and writes two different things. That is, it outputs a new master file in which any customer record that had not been updated just copied as it is on the current master file. But a master file record held in memory with transactions applied to it is then written out to the updated master file different than it was on the current master file. As a byproduct, reporting is produced. At a minimum, this reporting would indicate what happened to each transaction as it interacted with the master file. If there were something wrong with the transaction, invalid data on it, it would have failed and that would be reported in one or more documents so that it could be cleaned up and resubmitted on the next cycle. The next cycle for the updated master file would be that it becomes the current master file at the point of its creation and another update cycle that may occur the next day would use it as a current master file. And as you can see, every day a new generation of a master file is created with this kind of processing. This kind of processing is very efficient from the point of view of the machine usage. It can process tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of transactions a minute, much faster than anybody could apply those transactions online. But it's batched because the changes are batched up all day and only in the evening does an update occur in which a new master file is produced. This was very efficient for a machine to process things this way and the more sophisticated operating systems on mainframes would allow multiple programs like this to be processing at the same time. So quite a lot of throughput can be gained with that type of massive computing horsepower. This kind of processing, however, is hardly known really on PCs because everything about a PC is intended to be interactive with the user interacting with the program. This type of operation may seem kind of foreign to you. Mainframes were adapted to online processing even though they were not inherently designed to do this type of processing. With the use of a program that would run continuously as if it were a batch program, it would handle the communication with various users on an interactive basis. This is called a teleprocessing monitor, and when in use, the configuration for a mainframe would look something like this diagram. Now all the programmers down at the bottom work in a centralized installation. They write the programs for the mainframe computer, including batch and online programs, and the mainframe communicates with dumb terminals. 
That is, terminals that really have no intelligence to do anything locally, but are simply useful as input-output devices to a computer. And those terminals in the IBM mainframe world look like this. Rather heavy machines with a flat green screen and a keyboard that was also rather heavy with a metal case. This was IBM's 3270 type of terminal and it communicated very rapidly with this kind of configuration that you see in this diagram. In the 1970s and beyond, another type of computer became a competitor to the mainframe and it was called a mini computer because a number of things about it were smaller than mainframes. For one thing, a mini computer was much less expensive, typically had less capabilities, but that was fine. It could be adapted to doing rather specialized processing in various niche areas of firms. For example, engineering or various kinds of research and development the accounting department in a firm might have the mainframe and run applications that had to do with a lot of administrative work or the order entry systems and various other kinds of things that might even be made accessible to customers. But in the back room, in the back areas of the company were engineering or computer-aided manufacturing or computer-aided drawing or automated mapping might be done. Many computers typically would serve that task better than a mainframe because of the way that mainframes were programmed to do this high volume, essentially batch or high volume teleprocessing oriented business data processing. Many computers, when they were placed out in various departments, tended to be isolated islands of computing. Some of the personnel associated with programming might have been shifted out to the outlying areas and this diagram would imply that the complement of programmers supporting the mainframe might have declined. That wasn't always the case because the demand for applications to be run on all types of computers in an organization usually meant that the information processing area was growing rather than shrinking. At the left you see a mainframe computer installation, several boxes, several types of input output devices in the background, perhaps a printer, perhaps a card reader. To the right you see a typical mini computer of the 1970s. That set of cabinets is the entire computer. The printing device next to it would typically be simply for the operator to communicate with the machine. Various users would have that sort of a teletype device, a printing device, or a dumb terminal to interact with this machine. By the 1990s, personal computers, which were invented in the 70s, had really caught on, and they began to replace dumb terminals and even mini computers. PCs became very capable, and various types of applications specific to an industry would either run on a PC, that is an IBM version of a personal computer, or on a Mac, that was very big in the design industries and in the printing industry. These could be hooked up in the place of dumb terminals. But another development that you see occurring here is servers, which are represented by the little blue boxes above the mainframe. Servers are rugged, high-performance machines of a personal computer architecture. They're fairly inexpensive, and they can be ganged up in multiples to provide what's known as a server farm. Some of the processing, some of the applications, even in a mainframe installation, began to be shifted to these in the 1990s. By 2000, some installations had actually wheeled the mainframe out and relied entirely on server farms and newer types of programming to support the applications in a business. This is about where many industries are now. Although many companies still retain mainframes for their very high volume applications, the same programs that are run on the mainframe now could be run in emulation on a large server farm. Companies like Google and Amazon, who support a huge number of users and thousands of transactions a minute, actually don't use mainframes. They use server farms in which there might exist tens of thousands of individual servers. Google, in fact, has a huge installation in Northern California that uses truck shipping containers, each of which house a thousand servers in a rack, and all of those storage containers, about 45, are contained in a big warehouse building. So that's the architecture of a modern, large, large installation. What about the future? Another development that 
is occurring at this time is with those huge server farms maintained by very major vendors like Amazon and Google, those businesses have started making some of their computing power accessible to other users, more or less renting computer power out to other firms that could conceivably wheel all of their servers and equipment out the door and just depend on high-speed internet connections to the cloud. It's called the cloud because it's represented that way on some types of system diagrams. It's just out there in the internet. Of course, doing that, you're trusting that the internet communication will be high-speed enough to support your applications and that the vendor that you're choosing to do business with is reliable and will maintain their machinery to be up what's called five nines. That's 99.99999% of the time. But it's easier for larger vendors to do that because it's very specialized and they have huge installations. It's possible, of course, for a local firm that maintains its own computers to have downtime because it's an awful lot of work to maintain everything running all the time and with all the software updates that come out from various vendors as well. So some businesses are buying into this idea of cloud computing. Even as an end user, you can make use of it with a service like Dropbox or Carbonite that lets you park your files out there and synchronizes what's out on their cloud with what's on your local computer. And that's a very handy way of doing backups. Well, even the cloud isn't the end of the road as far as the evolving nature of computers. What firms are confronting now is desktops giving way to mobile devices, typically tablet computers of one variety or another, or smart cell phones, which are getting larger and larger screens and more and more capable. One of the major issues facing firms now with this sort of bring-your-own-devices is security that if these devices actually have access to applications that the organization maintains, whether they're supported locally or on the cloud, how secure are those devices? If a device gets hacked into by somebody, then conceivably anything that device can access in the organization systems is vulnerable too. The issue of security will continue to be a concern for organizations using computers regardless of whether they support computers locally or they subscribe to some type of cloud support for their applications.